Hey, um, Neil, come on up and join me. Hi, everyone. Thanks for sitting through with us with technical difficulties and all the rest. I guess part of doing community-driven work is rolling with the punches. My name is Lauren Ellen McCann. Two of those are my first name. And with me here is Neil Bear. Neil, you may recognize, if you're very good at matching credits to faces, as a uh, well-renowned television writer and producer. He's been associated with such tiny projects as ER, Law and Order, SVU, um, Under the Dome, and he is one of the co-producers of If You Build It. So we don't have a ton of time, but I wanted to set, do like a little bit of scene setting and then ask you a few questions if you're ready to roll. We'll also pitch this out to all of you who I can half see here in the mist. Um, but to give a, just like a little bit of preface, so I am, I'm a, um, design justice worker. I'm someone who uses community-led processes um, as part of my work. So it's a complicated phrasing, but I want to start here because what we just saw in If You Build It is one method of community design. There's a myriad of them. And the thing about when we try to use language to encapsulate actual processes, not just nice, simple, easy jargon phrases, it's easy to lose the details, the principles, the methodologies. That's why when Catherine was up here earlier, contextualizing the work that Resilient Communities is doing in um, New America, NYC, based here, right here in your city, um, she started with principles, because it's from principles that we're able to direct the actions that we create. When you're looking at the landscape of community leadership in design, um, and as I think was outlined in a good detail here during the film, there's many different points in the process when you can include people in the, in the actual creation of anything, whether it's a farmer's market, a piece of technology, um, a governance system, right? There's a wide variety of things. But there's also a variety of different points that people can be part of the process. And there's also a big difference between injecting people into a process and actually um, allowing for their vision and their creative confidence to develop. So I think I just wanted to contextualize that what we saw here tonight was, was one method of many. Um, what Resilient Communities is doing here in New York City is a very different method. What I do in Washington, D.C. is also different. But this is also teeing me up to ask, Neil, I'm so curious how you came into contact with this whole field of design, and in particular, um, as I understand it, Emily's work. Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you to Shelley and, and Larry, who we thanked at the end of the film, who funded, they're sitting back there, who funded this film and made it possible. So thank you, both Shelley and Larry. Because um, when you make documentaries, when you make documentaries, you're scraping just as you're making buildings like uh, the kids and, and Emily and Matt did. It's, you know, piece by piece, brick by brick. So we're very grateful to them. Um, I read a book from the TED Talks called Design Revolution, 100 Products That Can Change the World by Emily Pilliton. And I read it all in one sitting and I just was so inspired because there was a, a plethora of different projects that made a difference around the world using you kind know, of very basic materials. For instance, like cutting tires in half and building playgrounds in, in Africa. Actually, Emily had done that and, and using uh, using these structures to teach, teach mathematics. So I was really struck and loved it, and I loved the design thinking element of it. And so I went to IDEO, which is an organization that um, designs products like the mouse, the Swiffer, needless vaccine, uh, vaccines, and, and was really taken with the work they were doing. And they had worked with Emily as well, and she had worked with them. And they're based in California, Northern California, but they're also here. And they, IDEO.org does uh, the nonprofit side of design to address problems around the world. So I was very interested in that and um, as a physician as well as a writer and producer. And so I contacted Emily actually through Facebook. I Facebook friended her and then I, I sent her a message and said, I have to meet you. And she lived in San Francisco then and so we got together and I flew up there from LA where I live and she told me that she was about to embark on this crazy project of going to the poorest county in North Carolina, Bertie County, to work with her boyfriend Matt to teach design to these kids that Chip Zollinger um, 
had uh, found them and heard about the work. And then, of course, as you saw in the film, Chip was fired soon after they got there. And that's the struggle of making a documentary. We thought, well, there's no documentary now because Chip was fired about, about a month into our making the film, but then Matt and Emily decided to stay, and, and uh, then the film came into being. Um, so it was just sort of my, through my in, in, intention to get to know Emily, and social media got, made it happen that uh, I was able to do it. And I just, when I met her, and as you can tell, as a filmmaker, you can tell when people, both when I work with actors and when I do documentaries, that some people just have these personalities. And some of the kids do, of, of course, as well, and we feature them, that they're very um, cinematic. And Emily is certainly really cinematic and emotional and thoughtful. And I just knew, meeting her, that she would make a great subject. And though you're just, you're, you're you also go there with hopes that it'll work because you just never know for sure. So it, that's, how, that's how it all got started. And then we, the first place we went to was the, I went to the MacArthur um, Foundation and got my first grant. And then it built over time from Sundance. And we have so many, we had so many funders by the end because it takes a lot of funders, as I said. Speaking of time, actually, one of the things I was very struck by in this film is the important insistence on the fact that the project isn't actually the farmer's market. It's investing in the capabilities, the creativity, the confidence, the different skill building of these individuals, um, these individual students, these individual people, and all the people they come into contact with. And in order to do that, whether or not, I know the, the question of the salary was a big issue in this film, but whether or not their salary, the, the ability to fund organizers, essentially. People who are often, and I, I think the preferred methodology is actually to fund people who are already in the community um, to invest in that work. But I, I appreciated that the film didn't back away from that point because I, what I see a lot in the innovation landscape in 2016 is a lot of people wanting things very quickly. Um, they shortchange a lot of that relationship development. And I, I really appreciated that that was very present here. But this teased me up to ask, this film was made in 2013. What's happened in the last three years? Lots. Um, so Matt and Emily are no longer together. And you can <laughs> sort of see that the relationship is sort of starting to fray. And it really took, took, a, 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 you know, it took a toll on them. And they were lovely to work with and we're still friends with both of them. And Emily is still in Berkeley just doing incredible work. She's at the magnet school. She's really focusing on girls and teaching girls um, like nine to 14 design and shop and building and they've built all kinds of structures in Berkeley and Matt was in Colorado and now he's teaching um, in Idaho and doing the same thing. So they are both committed to doing that. Um, the kids, um, three of them went to college. None of them, as I recall, had families who went to college. So Karan uh, is just finishing his engineering degree and he, he, thanks, he thanks Emily and Matt, and Eric has finished his degree, and the one who's most surprising is Stevie, who went to college and is not a farmer. He wants to be an actor. But um, <laughs> what have we done <laughs> to poor Stevie? Uh, Stevie has been out to LA. Um, no, but Stevie still works on his farm, but Stevie has ambitions way beyond, and so he also thinks, you know, they all are indebted to Emily and, 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 and Matt, and you can see how school and teachers can make a difference. Jamisha went into the military, um, Cameron is an emerge, uh, EMT, um, so they all say, and they, it was just a, an experience that really changed their lives, and, and they're, they're in touch with the kids still, and we're in touch, Christine, my partner on it, O'Malley, my producing partner is in touch with the kids all the time. And when we have screenings in North Carolina or places where they are, the, the kids, the kids uh, always show up and their parents. It really had a, a profound impact. The whole school board was fired. <laughs> you know, but there was, there, was, there was some issues with the school board and I, I like to think that, and I know that uh, the film had some impact. Um, uh, you know, and the where, you know, as we show where money goes and, and uh, 
the, 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 the guy, Ron Wesson, became an elected official and is still an elected official. So he's the one who said that uh, you know, there was only one grocery store. And, and I think the other thing I want to say is that um, what, I, what I love about the film is using this design thinking approach that Emily goes through where you start with um, research, ideation, de uh, design, prototype, um, uh, redesigning it and, and building it. And um, so it's, that works in all, and as Emily and Matt say, in, in all realms of life, really. And you saw that the kids were taking online PE, and that was really horrifying to us. And that was going on in uh, online everything, half the day. Half the day spent with Matt and Emily, half the day all of them stuck in that room. Um, and what's really, what's really interesting to me is that, um, you know, that hasn't changed so much there because Emily and Matt were fired um, because they had built this, you know, you can imagine the politics. But it, 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 it really did change the kids' lives. And, and it's, it, to me, when Matt talks about Detroit and that it was top down and he, he you know, devoted himself to building this house and giving it to a family, but the family was not engaged at all in the making of that house. It wasn't their story, as, as uh, Matt says. And to me, this is my favorite part of the film, but this is their story. And this was Stevie, really Stevie, who designed, Stevie and CJ, but Stevie designed um, the farmer's market that they actually chose. So it came out of their story, one of unemployment, lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables, and obesity. And so I think that that has huge implications for schools and the way we deal with social policies. And if you're interested, there's a wonderful book called Change by Design by, by Tim Brown, who is very influential on, on Emily's work. And he's the head of IDEO. And it, it looks at how to take um, a, a design thinking approach rather than this, we know what's best for you approach. Well, and you actually brought up something that I found really challenging about the film. So coming not necessarily from design thinking, but a kin field design justice, um, which actually predates design thinking, and many of the people who developed design thinking were either influenced by it or sometimes just not even aware that this tradition had existed. Um, it, depending on how you trace it, there's methodologies that started in the 1960s of this very similar um, format, also called co-design. And a big tenet of design justice is, is looking at the entire context of creation. And I, I think the Detroit scene that you brought up, I found really difficult because it didn't address any of the structural racism or classism involved in that kind of house desecration. And I know when you're working with the film, you have limited narratives available to you. Um, but I, I did watch the engagement with the school board and some of the lack of transparency there and seeing that thinking filtering in. But I, I was just wondering, since you lifted up the scene in particular, how that registers for you. In terms of how we presented it or, because I'm yeah. really interested in, in the, the notion of, and there's such huge debate about um, aid, particularly foreign aid. Yes. And this notion of top down versus bottom up. And so um, I think the point that Matt was making was that there needs to be engagement that when it's, when it's um, a very sort of, um, almost patronizing or we're, t you know, we're telling you uh, what's best for you and we're going to give you something and you should appreciate it. Um, you know, I don't know actually, we, I don't know what happened to the house. I, I, you know, and, and I don't think the, fi you know, I think that people were coming into the house and just tearing, tearing out things to, to use. But I think the point we were trying to make was that when you don't engage people at the beginning and they're telling them what's best for them. And this can be, you know, there's a really wonderful book um, by Molly Melching, and she has an organization called Toastan, T-O-S-T-A-N. And I've been very influenced by them too, which she calls herself a social norm entrepreneur where she gathers women in Senegal to talk about female genital cutting. And instead of saying, this is bad or you shouldn't do it, she just, works as a, a moderator to let people tell their stories and decide what works for them. And this has had a huge impact across Senegal, Ethiopia, and, and Somalia. The point being is that people find their way through their own stories and not being told what to do. Yes, they need aid, they need support, but if you're going to do it in a way that is we know best, which we tend to do with 
aid, so that, that it's often, that this is problematic. And so it's, it's a, at least a way of kind of bringing together, um, not always harmoniously, people to, um, to, to struggle with their own problems. And, and as Matt said, that this was the kid's story. This was the story, or Emily says it at the end too, if, if it had been in a city, maybe an urban area, they wouldn't have done a farmer's market. They would have, whatever the story was. And I think that that's an approach, but certainly what you say in terms of building for justice is one has to recognize all of the issues, you know, all of the, the barriers, be it immigration issues or race, class, LGBT, all the things that we think about um, or I think about in the work I do as a physician in designing projects for, for global health, I think apply to what you're saying and, it, and, and has to be, and I think it has to be stated outwardly um, when you're taking on these projects. Absolutely, and I really appreciate the way in which you were framing agency as part of this and, and you know, these different design methods that attempt to allow communities to harness their own self-determination, right? And, and based on the varieties of different contexts and the complexity of power that are present in these spaces. Right. And it's messy. I mean, it's much easier to say, hey, I know what's best for you and don't do this and just you do that and we're gonna give you this. And then it's not, there's no ownership. So we are doing actually, knock on wood, we have a, a TV series based on the film and we're, in, we're doing it, we're hoping to do it soon and it's just, on a larger scale, we go into a city, and the city, you know, the, 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 the neighborhood associations, the people who are leaders, the, you know, when they're bringing people together, you know, to talk about the problems, will decide what they need based on their story. And then we will bring in designers, architects, and social, social entrepreneurs, and they'll fight it out. Because, you know, it'll be like, you know, as you saw in the film, it's not just one way to do something, and that's, but I think it, it, it has more power to succeed if, if, if people are invested. And, and there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of academic work in these areas, certainly about, about aid as well. And I think there's also been a lot of, in, in the world of teaching, I mean, the world of um, Pablo Fieri and popular education is very much steeped in this. And also, one of the things I saw echoed in the design thinking approach from popular education is the use of arts and different communication styles as part of that. And it's also a big motivator. One of my favorite examples of community leadership in design um, is the work of the Prometheus Radio Project, which w Prometheus would be called by a community that wanted to establish their own communications network to work with different community members there um, to get a radio tower up and running in the course of a three-day period, including a full programming lineup and support to keep the programs on the air for months and years afterward. And they have a number of different success stories in different communities there. But I don't see a lot of, I don't see a lot of mainstream attention to these very process-informed Projects. Well, you know, I think I think that's what's really interesting. Um, a, an interesting um, kind of movement across the United States, and you'll see it sort of popping up now more and more. Which is on a national level, things are you know pretty pretty crazy and screwed up. You have to go into communities, and when you go into communities, you see all kinds of amazing things. Like in, I think it was I just read in. I want to say it was in Chattanooga, but it was in Tennessee, where they had some problems with roads and driving and people getting to places. And so they, so the, the, the city itself took, took upon itself to do the surveys and, and leaders and, and citizens. And, and they got together and they established bike lanes and new parks and kind of re-sort of thought the way people drove through the city and changed um, the city in a profound way. And so I think we're seeing across the US really important things happening at the town level and the city level, but when we start to get to the state and national level, things seem to be, not seem, seems things are in terrible disarray. And I don't know what the solution to that is, but I, I do think that there is hope at the, that people at the, the local level are really just taking it upon themselves to say, we have these problems and we need to find solutions and we can't wait for the feds to, to come in, even though we need the feds to you know, supply the, often the funding. 
I mean, I'm pretty biased because I'm from a community like the one pictured in the film, and I'm a first-generation college student. So I think I've grown up in contexts where I see people building from their own context with themselves all the time. But I really take your point that it's about the perspective that we're looking at for this work, whether we're not gonna find it. Um, we have very limited time, but I was wondering, we've got time for two questions if folks wanna pop up. Yeah. Hold on one second. Oh, just give me one second. I'd, ask, I'd like to ask about how or whether, what sort of correlation there is between this design um, initiative and the way in which it functions from ground up and the documentary film making process in which you are gathering information, hopefully ground up, and whether you think that there is in documentary filmmaking now a shift away from that process and if that could be damaging to the whole field of documentary. <laughs> no pressure. That's a, no, that's a, that's a really interesting question because I can think of a film, you know, that was, was nominated for an Oscar and didn't win this year that had, that had some issues. That's a really complicated question. What's really interesting about documentaries is that they can be advocacy films or they can be films that kind of just unspool the story. So yes, you know, and I always say we're never objective in the way that wherever we put the camera is where we put the camera, even though we had Jamisha shooting and there's a lot of her footage in, in here as well. So it was that kind of approach where we actually have the student working with us and her, and her footage is there. But it, whatever your intent is, I think you were, you were speaking that is really important. If your intent is to change social policy, you might make a different kind of film and it might get you into trouble when you're really focused for, for a good cause and a good effect and a good impact, but things might get shifted a little bit. So, you know, even on, for instance, Katie Couric's recent documentary comes to mind as another one where it was on, on gun control. And they did, it, did, did say that they kind of played with the the pauses and things to intensify the drama. So you have to be really kind of open about and aware of what your intent is and very careful. And when you start to fiddle with things and add lines and shoot stuff later, and you know, nothing is objective. There's no, you know, reality television, and I'm not talking about the Kardashians, but even any kind of reality cooking show, whatever, things are just, you know, scripted. And, and, and so you, nothing is going to be objective, but you try to let the story unfold. And what I love about our film is that we didn't know what the outcome would be because we kept thinking they're going to quit and we've spent all this money, <laughs> we won't have a film. And that's the risk you take. So there's all kinds of pressures on the documentary filmmaker as well because you're putting in a lot of money, you're raising money, you have funders, investors, so you want to, to make a good film, you want it to be dramatic, but sometimes, you know, it just can't be. We were, you know, I hate to say it, we were lucky that Chip left and that Emily and, and Matt, you know, were fired in that sense that it made it a more dramatic film, but who knows what any other outcomes would be. But I think you have to be very careful about what your intent is, because if your intent is to be an advocate, I mean, I'm an advocate for changing education, but if you, you have to be very careful to let the story speak and not let your own um, wishes speak because then you can get into trouble and then things start to happen with films and then people start writing letters saying what you did is not correct and, and you know, and when you have a, a, a cause and, and that happens and it's not easy because you want to make a, you know, in order for a film to be successful, it has to be dramatic in some way. It has to be moving and and so you have, have all of these external pressures on you to, to kind of sometimes push it in that direction. So that's always um, something that at least I feel you have to be aware of and you have to be willing to say, you know, we might have to walk away from this. We might have to just let it go um, because there won't be a, a, a story. We were fortunate that there is a story. And as I said at the very beginning, you also select people who you think just 
who, who are interesting. And Emily is just an interesting person. She's really fun to be with. She's super smart. She has great ideas. And I thought, you know, no matter what happens, she's so interesting that I want to know about what design thinking is. I want to know what these things are. So, you know, we're going to run with it. Thank you. We have time for one more. Good evening. Uh, first, thank you both so much, and thank you to the filmmakers and to New America. Uh, I want to add one thing and then ask the question. The thing I would also humbly like to submit is that one of the other challenges is to make a film that is not accus accusatory nor didactic and at the same time doesn't shy away from whatever the, the issues that you are trying to depict on the screen, which is a tall order for document documentary filmmakers. With respect to this particular film and how you framed the, what I like to call the NGO approach, which is to parachute into an area and then determine from their perspective what's best for the area, not including the stakeholders. This particular film seems to me to be on various levels a civic engagement piece, a advocacy piece. And at the same time, I'm questioning how do you create a sustained engagement so that when the film makers, when the film is finished, that what it has been able to depict continues to create an environment of sustainability, of empowerment, and allowing those communities to give license to others to take the same type of initiative sans the cameras. That's a great question. Um, so we keep in touch with the kids and follow the kids and now with, um, uh, you know, Facebook and, and our website, we can do that. And then we developed um, a social networking platform called Action Lab. So if you go on actionlab.org, after you see the film, we give you a number of different ways to be engaged. So if you want literally to build a farmer's market in your community, we tell you how to do that and how to get pro bono support from various architectural organizations. And so we've done it with another a book that I worked on about soda politics and also an, for a museum exhibit. And so we're trying to build that. So we're really interested in the after effect that what we call bridging the gap for the audience. First we'll talk about the audience for the audience, bridging the gap between inspiration and action so that when you see this and you say, oh, I want to have a farmer's market or I want to get um, uh, EBT food stamps in my farmer's market, but I don't know how to do that. Well, people have done it and we can tell you how to do it. And so you can click through actionlab.org and see how to do that. So that, that's one thing we've tried to do is give people actionable steps they can take when they're inspired. For the community, it's, it's you know, um, talking about showing the film. The film's been used a lot to, like it was recently used in Gary, Indiana, we know, to build support for farmer's markets and in, in, for a farmer's market there and in numbers of places. So it's shown often as a fundraiser to start farmer's markets. Um, in the community, it's staying in touch with the kids. One thing we do that we, and, and supporting Stevie as he sort of figures out if he wants to become a filmmaker or not. <laughs> so we're, so we're, 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 we're around Stevie. But what we typically do, I also work with an organization called Venice Arts, which is a wonderful or, uh, organization in Los Angeles where we teach filmmaking to kids. Um, and so when we were in Mozambique, for instance, a couple years ago, we made a film. We taught a kid. It's called Home is Where You Find It. We taught a kid how to, how to shoot. And he was a, a young man whose parents died of AIDS, and he was looking for a family because there's no foster care or orphanages in Mozambique. And if you don't have an extended family, you live on the street. So we gave him the camera and, he, and taught him, and he found someone to live with. And we taught the kids photography, and their photographs are in the film because we feel that it's also very important. That's why we gave Jamisha the camera, that we have a certain perspective, but she'll get access in ways that we don't. So we give that training to the, to the students who are interested. And then when we go to different places, both in the US and around the world, we leave a little institute that we fund to continue teaching kids or mothers in Cape Town with HIV. We did a project with them and taught them um, photography. And we try to, we try to um, not recreate, you know, from the very beginning, the, we, we always partner, so we partner, with an we partner with an organization called Mothers to Mothers, which teaches 
women with HIV how to prevent transmission to their babies and they teach other women. And we taught women in that organization <laughs> photography and then we sent two of them to photography school in Cape Town. So we try to, and I, and I think it's really important, keep something going and we also work with local photographers as well when we do our photography projects so that there's somebody there who then can be paid and then we have to fundraise for that. So there are a number of ways that we try to do that um, to, to keep things going so that it's not just for us, like, oh, we want to make a great film and thank you very much and shh, goodbye. But, um, and, and it's challenging because, you know, it's often not clear what one can do and you don't want to leave you don't want to do a, something that's going to cause problems. You know, the film, in some ways, you know, when you make a film, it's always an advocacy film because you're choosing the subject that you choose. Like, you know, when I do my, when I do my dramatic shows, you know, I've never pretended to be objective. You know, it's me, so that's why I chose to do teen access to abortion or um, vaccinations or whatever because of my own experience as a physician. So I try to be open about that, but I try to present the different sides um, and not make, you know, in this case, in this, this, this film, the school board look too, I mean, it was hard because, you know, they were just so in, intransigent about everything. But, um, but um, you know, it's always about power. But it's something, you know, again, you have to be, be really careful about because it, it's really easy to pr portray people as, as evil or, or good and you just, you know, we didn't have access really to this, you know, we wanted to have the school board and, you know, they didn't want to be involved and so, you know, I guess we could have said, you know, we tried to get the school board to, to talk on camera but then we didn't want it to feel like a news piece. So you're always like struggling and that's always the struggle of the film and then you, when you make your next one you kind of hope, hopefully learn from whatever you know, problems you had, how to make it better the next time. But that was a great question, thanks. I, I, In terms of editing. Well, that's what you do. You go through so many iterations, just like in design thinking. This, this, what you see, was a long process. It was much longer, probably twice as long. You have to whittle out. You have to decide what students to focus on. So you're making decisions all the time in making this film. There are a couple students you see a little bit, but you don't see them very much because they dropped out or they just weren't there very much. Um, that and is then you editing. Have, and that's the editing. And so you have to decide, but you don't. You try not to fake thing, or at least we try not to make things happen that didn't really happen, um, or have lines later that are added because we need... We actually need to just, I'm sorry to end this line of conversation, but we do need to draw to a close. We'll have a little bit of time for conversation in the lobby, and I'm sorry to talk over you. But I do think this is a great point to kind of let us back out into the world on, which is even as we think about building with communities instead of just for them, we ourselves are actors that are engaged in this process. And I think that statement that you just made about the process of making the films itself, a design thinking, design justice iterative process, is one of the most important things we can think about as individual creators and people in communities together. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming. Thank you, New America.